My name is Stephen Bennett. I'm a portrait painter. I travel around the world painting portraits of indigenous people. My mission is to use my portraits to educate others about indigenous culture. The world's indigenous cultures live in the most diverse, colorful, and fantastic ways. I want to help empower these people to continue in their traditional ways of life. What you're about to see are some of my adventures as I attempt to learn more about the Aboriginal people of Australia. This is a film about the subjects in my paintings. These are the people that inspire my work. Come along down under and take a look. Australia is an island continent and one of the most sparsely populated countries on Earth. It is also one of the driest and flattest continents on the planet. However, Australia is a land of great diversity and also contains tropical rainforests, majestic rivers, snow-capped mountain ranges, vast grasslands, and of course, the fiery red interior. To those outside Australia, the myths are many. Amazing surfing, bush rangers, boomerang throwers, and very strange animals. Ever since I can remember, the one thing that really fascinated me about Australia were its Aboriginal people. They are the oldest continuous culture in the world, having lived on the Australian continent for at least 50,000 years. What customs and practices could be so enduring, and how had life changed since the invasion of Europeans roughly 200 years ago? Were Aboriginal people still living traditionally or not? I was determined to find out. The first British explorers landed near Sydney, and Sydney was also my first stop in Australia. All major Australian cities are on the coast, so the water is never far away. On the wild Sydney beaches, the surf can be huge. Check out this surfer I saw during a storm off Coogee Beach. It was across this ocean that Aboriginals were first spotted the British ships. The beautiful coastline where Sydney now stands is sacred land for Aboriginals. Many tribes had fished, hunted, and carried out their traditional ways of life in these locations for thousands of years. Speaking to a number of prominent Aboriginals gave me more of an understanding of what it is like to be an Indigenous person in Australia. They helped me understand the state of affairs between whites and blacks who I later learned are called white fellas and black fellas. Full name is Lyle James Munro. When Captain Cook came here, there was 5,000 tribes, mm -hmm. 500 different dialects, and 95% of that still operates. The laws and customs hasn't changed. Aboriginal law never changes, not one bit of it changes. Um, European law, the um, local government um, puts down boundaries. State governments put down electoral boundaries, but the Aborigine boundaries are there forever and ever, 213 years and hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. And they've got to understand there is a different nation of people. The only thing we want is recogn recognition in Australia as a race of people. We're gradually getting that. And I've got no doubt sooner or later that um, the elected body of people, black and white, will sit down and talk and say, uh, let's form some form of agreement, a compact or a treaty recognizing that there is another race of people here and, and, and joining, joining all, all the indigenous people up together. And when you look at Australia, uh, they talk about migrants and wogs. Well, we're just about all wogs and migrants in Australia, except 19 million of us, except the Aboriginal people, the Aboriginal island nations. Valerie Lina was one of the first Aboriginal people I painted in Australia. Here I am, hard at work on her portrait. She is a member of the Stolen Generation. The story of the Stolen Generation is a sad one. Due to an Australian government policy, from 1883 to 1969, over 100,000 half-caste indigenous children were forcibly taken away from their families. During this time, the Aboriginal race was seen as a problem. 
Many whites believe that aboriginals would be absorbed into white culture or die out completely. The goal of the Australian government at this time was to accelerate the process of assimilation and to eliminate the aboriginal culture. These children were raised by whites away from their parents in special camps. Most of these children never saw their parents again. This group of people is now called the Stolen Generation. Valerie Linnau was the first member of the Stolen Generation to receive financial compensation from the government. The Stolen Generation was always the street, street kids. Yeah. So there was ten, ten in my family. Ten? Yeah. In your immediate, under your in, ten children of your mother? In, yeah, my mother. Your yeah, mother ten. had ten children yeah. that were taken away? Yep. When they put you to school, they don't, they don't, they won't educate an Aboriginal person, mm -hmm. because I, if they educate an Aboriginal person, I think the Aboriginal person will come more impure over the white, oh, white people. Yeah. So you you leave school at fifteen, and then you, uh, then you go and work for white families, the domestic work. Apologising to the stolen generation, it's a big, it's a big thing just to hear those words. It's not the amount of money, it's the acknowledgement, it's the justice, adjustment and the it's the recognition that these things happen to the Aboriginal people. Yeah. Did that make you feel better when you Oh, it made received? me, oh, it made me was feel... That a, was that a good day? Oh, yeah, I was overwhelmed. <laughs> I said great, it wasn't huh? the money, but hear that word, uh, justice. I got that justice for Isn't over 45 years, I waited. You feel Aboriginal, and that's still part of you, even though you went through this whole experience. Yeah, I'm, is that I'm, true? Yeah, I'm proud of being Aboriginal. I'm yeah, proud. That's proud wonderful. of who I am. Mm. And and what tribe did you come from? Bunjalan. Bunjalan. Up the north coast. Wow. And how do you say hi in their language? I wouldn't have the faintest yet. I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning. You're Give learning. me time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this is my completed portrait of Valerie expressing her vibrant personality. She, with all the other members of the Stolen Generation, are on a journey of healing and rediscovery of their heritage. Here are other portraits of the Stolen Generation members who I painted during my travels. There is only one Aboriginal member in Australian Parliament. His name is Senator Aidan Ridgway. He has a goal of bringing black and white Australians closer together. I come from the Goombangia people. Uh, to me, you've got to have um, an anchor. It doesn't matter about participating in yeah. Western society so long as you can come back to the source mm -hmm. of your own inspiration and your own being. The way that the historical systems and attitude have operated in this country have been that you must make a choice between one or the other. Uh, yeah. And I say to them, well, this is not a competition. You mm -hmm. can't exist in such a way as to still speak your own language and still right. speak English carry out your traditional customs and practices and mm -hmm. do that within the context of this society. Right. Do it in a way where you can share it with the non-Indigenous population. Yeah. That they might learn to speak some of the language as well. Yeah. There's no reason why. I mean, people learn French, people learn Italian, the yeah. whole range of things. We're happy to share that if people are prepared sure. to support how that might be done. Yeah. Aboriginal people have faced extreme challenges since the arrival of Europeans. Such hardships included being dispossessed of their lands, ravaged by new western diseases, and subject to massacres, poisoning, and genocide. There have been many ways that indigenous Australians have fought for reconciliation and recognition. The tribal warrior is one such example. Seen here, the tribal warrior proudly displays the Aboriginal flag. We're looking for reconciliation with yeah. Aboriginal people and other people. That's right. So we said we'll call them out Trouble Warrior, right. uh, which is more appropriate for us because we'll keep, we'll keep worrying the, uh, the government until we get a recognition or something. You know? Crewed only by Indigenous people, the Tribal Warrior circumnavigated Australia, raising awareness of Aboriginal issues. I rode alongside as she triumphantly sailed into Sydney Harbour. Well, my name's uh, Bruce Stewart. I'm the uh, CEO and chairperson for the Tribal Warriors Association. We've been on the job now for four months. The Tribal Warriors have been navigating Australia now since August 2001, mm -hmm. and it's making its return back in uh, today, uh, the long weekend, the night, and uh, we're actually going out to meet it now, and and uh, just have a great time when it comes back in. You know, the boys yeah. have been away for a while. This is Uncle Max, a tribal warrior member who I painted. Mm -hmm. 
Uncle Max performed a special smoke ceremony to officially welcome the tribal warrior home. This is Max's portrait, which captures him in his ceremonial dress. He has chalk markings on his face and wears a bandana of the Aboriginal flag. Luke Marajalia was the other tribal warrior member I painted. While sailing around Australia on the tribal warrior, he earned his captain's license. The largest concentration of Aboriginal people in Sydney is the neighborhood of Redfern. Everly Street in Redfern is now referred to as the Block. It has a dangerous reputation as a place to buy drugs and where black fellas get wild. However, it's also an important meeting point visited by indigenous people from all across the continent. A campfire burns during most nights, welcoming all those who dare to go into the mania of the block. I spoke to a local Aboriginal resident about the historical significance of Redfern. Well, we believe because of our cultural memory in that, we believe because we still gather here today and people come from here nationwide to meet their people and to, yeah, no, you know, no, our, right. our starting off point, right. we, we believe that that's a tradition we're carrying on, you know, it's something in our cultural memory. It's always been something special about this place. People have bled and died and fought for this place, you know, yeah. in this big picture like it's just a drug haven for criminals and stuff like that, but there's a heart and soul and spirit here, you know, and yeah, it's black really fellas, more or less. They pioneered this country, you know, like, like they, you know, like when they talk about pioneers and people like Burke and Wills and Cunningham and all that, mm -hmm. Oxley, or whoever. Um, there was always, there was always blackfellas there, you know. Like, always, they always got help from them. Yeah, he always help from blackfellas, you know. All the cities and all the things they all built on our song lines, you know, like and all the main water holes and stuff like that. All the capital cities. That's why this place is so important. Redfern is filled with many interesting characters, all with unique stories. These are some friends I made hanging out at the block. What were the three languages that you speak? I speak good Nimiji, good Nalaji, and Dangari. And where are those, where are those tribes or languages from? And they're from uh, North Queensland. Okay. See, where, where I come from, see, well, I, never speak, I never spoke English till I was 13. And the first time I seen a white man, I thought he was a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how old were you? How old were I you? I was only well, uh, 13. Yeah, yeah my uh, mother's Aboriginal, uh, uh -huh. and well, we all started back in 1954. Uh -huh. You know, when white fellas weren't allowed in the mission. So when my father got caught in the mission, they they locked him up. Oh, he was a white fellow. Yeah. So uh -huh. so when he got out of jail, he said, "Oh, well, I'll go and marry this one." So they got married, and they took us to the mission then. The last person I painted in Redfern was White Dreads. I chose to paint him because, well, in that part of town, he was the dude. Most of the places where indigenous people are still able to live traditionally are in the deserts of Australia's interior and in the northern regions where the land is too hostile or wild to be farmed or settled. If you want to get out and see these people, you have to be prepared to travel some serious miles, often across very rough country. In Redfern, after asking where I could meet people living traditionally, everyone told me to go to Arnhem Land. Arnhem Land is one of the largest Aboriginal reserves in the Northern Territory. With a couple of lucky connections, I was on my way. My final destination would be Yurkala and the land of the Yonal people. It was a five-hour flight from Sydney to Darwin, the Northern Territory's capital city. From Darwin, it took us two days by car to cross Arnhem Land to reach Yerkala on the coast of the Bay of Carpentaria. This is an incredibly isolated region with little contact with the outside world. We arrived at nighttime, just in time for a traditional celebration of partying and music. The Yerkala area is a place where, according to Yonal law, the didgeridoo came into being. In Yono language, the didgeridoo is called the Yadaki.
Aboriginal history tells that the world was created during the dream time. The dream time was a time when the Aboriginal ancestral beings traveled over the land and created the animals and landscape. The dream time stories are also a basis for Aboriginal law, religion, and many general principles for living. Many Aboriginal songs sung around the campfire recount these stories. That night I made friends with two Yono women, Dopia and Dango. Dopia and Dango invited me out the next morning to find breakfast in the mangroves. The Bay of Carpentaria is the world of the saltwater crocodiles. I had been told to stay out of the water and away from the beach to avoid the big salties, but Dopia and Dango told me they weren't around. I asked them how they knew that there were no crocs around, and they just looked at me and waded out into the water. I guess if I wanted to come along, I had to just trust them. Found some shells? Yes. They're a clam, are they? Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Oh, so we're looking for those? Yeah, inside. Yeah. Ooh, like that one? Is that a good one? That's a good one? That's mm. a dead one. Dead one. We were looking for mud crabs, mangrove worms, and mangrove oysters. It was great to find people who were practicing their traditional ways of life and living off the land. Bush food in Australia, I found out, is called tucker, and mud crabs are good tucker. Mud crabs are a bit of a delicacy and taste a lot like lobster. So how do you find a mud crab? In the mud. You see a hole? A hole. And a green shell. Oh, they, they sit on the surface sometimes. Yeah. yeah. What? Oh, you caught one. Wow, so that's that's what we're looking for. Oh, he's still alive. But you break his claws off so he doesn't bite you? <laughs> Later that morning, I traveled to the ocean with a group of Yono men in search of Dalimbu, or sea clams. Beware, beware. If you're walking, because you can hardly see it. Don't touch it with your hand. Don't put your hand in. Wesley is walking barefoot through a jagged, living reef. The reef is home to many dangers, including my worst fear, the cone shell. The cone shell sting can kill you in under 10 minutes. I'm around. I'm around. Wesley taught us how to cut out the meat from the clams and then remove the toxins before eating. I tried the clam ear, and in my opinion, it tasted a bit like eating a fish-flavored eraser. After we had collected a feed of clams, we headed back to camp. We cooked the day's catch in a campfire on the beach under the scorching tropical sun. Everything was just thrown into the flames to grill. We ate everything with our bare hands, which was tricky work because the shells were sharp and hot. The Yono ladies were very skilled and made this look easy. 
I kept burning myself repeatedly, but it was worth it. I wasn't so keen on the mangrove oysters, but the mud crabs were delicious. They were tasty, juicy, and filling, and a welcome change from the road trip food I'd been eating. After the tucker, Wesley taught us some traditional yonel dances. They represent stories of spear fishing. All in all, I painted six people during my time in Arnhem Land. Let me introduce you to a few of them. This is Jalu Giroiri, whose traditional duty is caretaker of the Yidaki, or as we call it, didgeridoo. He lives on Ski Beach in Yurkala with his family making beautiful didges. His painting includes all the colors of his surroundings on the beach from sunrise to sunset. This painting is titled Dusty Road and Cookie Crumbs. I met this little girl along the gravel Arnhem Highway waiting for the general store to open. She was snacking on cookies and covered with dust from passing cars. Day Day Frank is a famous boomerang maker. He is one of the last craftsmen who knows the secret of making a perfect hunting boomerang. Thankfully, he's passing his skills down to young apprentices. Reconciliation is a powerful concept in modern Australia. Many indigenous and non-indigenous people are working together to heal the wounds of the past and create a more harmonious future. After 10 days in Arnhem Land, I traveled back to Darwin with Yolno people to attend a reconciliation ceremony. They were reconciling with white fellas and descendants of Northern Territory policeman Albert McColl. The ceremony took place in front of the Northern Territory Supreme Court. I joined the Yonel men as they prepared themselves. The events that gave rise to this ceremony are intriguing and show the problems that can occur when the laws of two cultures meet. In 1933, Yonel tribal elder Dakyar Weerpanda came across policeman Albert McColl. McColl had ventured deep into the wilderness of Arnhem Land to investigate the murder of some Japanese fishermen. McColl had chained up Dakyar's wife in an attempt to detain her and fired at Dakyar with his revolver. Through his actions, McColl had broken several Yono laws, and as a consequence, Dakyar speared the policeman through the leg and McColl died. In accordance with white law, Dakyar was taken back to Darwin to face the Northern Territory Supreme Court, where he was sentenced to death for murder. After much protest, the High Court, which is Australia's highest court, overturned the decision in order that Dakyar be acquitted and allowed to return to his homeland. But soon after Dakyar was released, he disappeared and never returned home. Rumor has it that he was killed, possibly by vengeful policemen or vigilantes. His remains have never been found. The Yonel relatives performed a special Wukiti ritual to guide the spirit of Dakyar back to their ancestral lands. Dakyar's case was the first time an indigenous person had ever appeared as a plaintiff in front of the high court. Well, the ceremony certificate today was because the way, the way that uh, our leader, if he would have got out of this jail, he would have went back home, yeah? This ceremony would have happened in back in his own country, back in his own land, back in his own well traditional land, but he never made it. That is why the important part that this ceremony is like a memorial ceremony to think back to that old man and putting this 
uh, particular ceremony here. That's putting him to rest, is it? Yeah. yeah. That's where he is now, rested in peace. Mm -hmm. And that ceremony that was continuing all day today, that ceremony, he would have been there singing with us, you know, yeah. leading us to the secret, sacred sites of playing. I then drove four hours southward from Darwin to Catherine, a rough and ready town on the edge of the desert. On the way south, I passed many of the legendary road trains that haul goods across Australia's outback. They are massive four and five section diesel trailers that stop for nothing and are a formidable foe when competing for road space. Because of the lack of railroads in the outback, road trains are a vital lifeline. It is amazing who you meet in the bush. About an hour outside Catherine, I pulled off the road to take a break and ran into Stax, a didgeridoo maker from Victoria. Stax was collecting wood to make his didgeridoos. What's your name again? Stax. Stax. Stax, that's me. There's wow. Stax and me. <laughs> Most of the work in making a didgeridoo is done by termites. Termites live in amazing mounds such as these in many areas of Australia. They mostly eat grass, but hollow out the trees by eating the soft wood in the center of the trunk. Stax had just finished collecting hollow trees when I spoke to him. Mally. Mally tree. Yep. Wow. Kind of hollowed out by termites. That's exactly and... how it was when I cut it down, yep. Wow. And where did that come from? Victoria. From Victoria. You got little little wax on Wax mouthpiece, yes. It was very fat at that end, too fat to yeah. play, and so you build a wax mouthpiece in order to reduce the size to a playable size. Wow. Yeah, just beeswax. Can you make a little sound on that? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Okay, a little sound. Stax demonstrated the circular breathing technique required to play a ditch properly. Circular breathing is a technique which allows the player to inhale and blow out at the same time, creating a constant sound. Boy, was he good. That's it! <laughs> After saying goodbye to Stax, I got back on the highway and headed into Catherine. My name is Glenn Bird. Uh, I'm originally from Queensland. It was in Catherine that I met Glenn, the owner of a local Aboriginal art gallery. Glenn told me of the Rainbow Serpent, which is a powerful creature associated with the dream time. He also explained the Aboriginal kinship system. Yeah, we all believe in one thing. This one thing is universal, I guess, no matter where we live. No matter who we are, whether we're urban or traditional, whether we live in Sydney or Kakadu. This one thing is called the Rainbow Serpent. We all believe in this thing called the Rainbow Serpent. It's central to how we came to be, mm -hmm. I guess. Created everything. Paddy Fordham, a well-known Aboriginal artist. Winner of the National Aboriginal Art Award in 1993. Mm -hmm. You see, he painted two Rainbow Serpents. Why did he paint two? To show there's a balance in Aboriginal society. And this balance is structured and controlled by what they call the moieties. Moiety means half of. So there are two sides, like yin and yang. Mm -hmm. And they call it dua and giricha. Mm -hmm. Now dua and giricha are controlled by skin names. There are 16. Four men, four women. Four men, four women. And if you're from this side, you must marry this side. If you're from this side, you must marry this side. Wow. And when you are born, you follow your father's side. Okay. Uh -huh. If I am Dua, my father will be Dua, obviously. Yeah. I become Dua. And your son is Dua. Yeah, my, the children follow the father's oh, side. Oh, boys and girls. Mm. Okay. Yeah? Wow. Okay. So my name is Balang. Okay. My name is Balang because my father's name is Wamut. Okay. Wamut's name is because his father's name is Gala. Yeah. And my son will always be Gamaram. Okay. Well, not quite always be, because um, I have a choice of marrying two women on this side. Mm -hmm. Two skin. I only know one I have to marry. 
to okay. be honest with you. So I marry Narichan. Okay. My wife will win Narichan. If my wife is Narichan, my son will be Gamaran. Okay. If my wife is a different name, my son will be a different name. Yes. To put this whole system in English terms, when you're uh -huh. born into the world, uh -huh. you, only, you only belong to two families. You're either a Smith or a Jones. Right. And if you're a Smith, the Joneses are your in-laws. If you're yeah. a Jones, the Smiths are your in-laws. Right. Okay? And there's only four tiers like any normal family. Right. Grandparents, mum and dad, you and your children. So if your name is Balang, uh -huh. and you meet another man when you go to go, whose name is Balang, like you, he's your brother. Really? Yeah. And you treat each other like yeah. Other, yeah. Like you lend you yeah. would lend you money if you, mm. if you but yeah. So there's sixteen names. Yeah. Like if my father's name is John Smith uh -huh. and my mother's name is Mary Smith, uh -huh. and all the John Smiths I meet and all the Mary Smiths I meet are all my mothers and my fathers. All of them. Fantastic. Yeah. That's great. You can't go wrong. <laughs> Alright? There are those people who live predominantly traditional lifestyles, like those I met in Arnhem Land. Then there are those people who live predominantly Western lifestyles, like those people I met in Redfern. Most Aboriginal people, however, live somewhere in between. In an Aboriginal community not far from Catherine, I was introduced to members of the Wallaby tribe. They are a mob that had traveled up from the Tanami Desert to play in the local football final. A mob is a name to describe your extended family. Hey guys, I'm shooting a little video. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You can go over it. Just want to kind of talk to you. Yeah, if you have to. So what, what's your name again? Lachlan. Lachlan? Ross. And Ross. And I'm Mel. I'm Dixon. Dixon. And where are you all from? Lagamano. Lagamano. Lagamano to tell my death. I know from the same oh, so we are Wolby, right in the same tribe. Wolby tribe. Wolby from the same tribe. Grandfather. Yeah. And were you relocated here or did you just come here when you were here? We used to come for football, you know. For some reason and for sports. For sports. Yeah, we always have sports. Yeah. Football. Oh, okay. Is there anything happening now with football? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're in the play. grand final. We're, we're in the final. The power of kinship was demonstrated to me by these men. They had inflicted themselves with wounds out of respect for dead relatives and were showing me their scars. Scarring is an important part of many Aboriginal rituals. As my contact with indigenous people continued, I became accustomed to these scars, and thanks to these men, I understood what they meant. And, uh, when did you get your, your scarring on your arm? When did they do that to you? We did that as a, when we lose our family, right? When you yep. lose your family member? Family, yeah. Oh, so when, these are your friends who have died? <laughs> yeah. Or your family yep. who has died? Family. Oh. Father in law, we respect them. Yeah, what do I do? tell me. Oh, it's through respect. It's respect. So each one of these marks is uh, someone that you lost in a. Yeah, yeah. Uh, respect who, who died. Family, when you lose a family. Who died. Yeah. 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 And you have them too. Yeah, there's a deep one. I got wow. this for my. Out of, uh, out of my, my wife. From uh. my. My wife loses father. Your wife yeah, lost her father. father -in -law. Yeah, my and wife lost his father. And so I got this for my father in law. Your father in law. Just go whack. How did how did that happen? What did they do to you? Oh, uh, what was it? Nah, I did it myself. Eh? I did it myself. You did it yourself with a knife. Yep. Yeah. No, not really not. So, with a, so you can respect. What did you do it with? Uh, something you know. Something sharp. Yeah. Something, something sharp. made of metal. No, nah, something. Uh, what, 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 what do we use you know, all the time? Is it made of wood, like a wooden thing, or a sharp knife will do? Yeah. Sharp knife. Sharp or is knife. It a stone. Yep. Was it no, a stone? sharp knife. Stone, oh, a knife. probably. Yeah, but this is it. from. What is it? I know. And these, you have a lot of the, a lot of friends you lost. This oh. one, yeah. Okay. And I got a mug here. You got one on your leg yeah, too. And from here, from the back. Oh, I see that. Yeah. So you right through. But the ones you get in front. Right through. Did you go to the hospital for that? No. Yeah, I went to hospital. Did they stitch it up? Uh, yeah, 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 I went to Alice Spring Hospital. Oh, they stitched it up. Yeah. This painting is called Catherine Drinking Camp. Alcohol drinking is prohibited in most Aboriginal communities, so drinkers head outside the community to drinking camps like this one to let off steam. Tonight they were in for a treat. Their friends were rigging up a TV out in the middle of nowhere to watch the Sydney Swans football team play. So you're gonna watch some TV tonight? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my, wow. my, my grandmother. She likes to watch TV? Yeah. yeah. Wow, did you just buy a new TV? Yeah, from town. Yeah. From town? Yeah. Oh, from, from down. So, uh, we got a TV here and yeah. this is the first time we got a TV here. Oh, that's great. Yeah. The first time. So we're going to watch. Plug it in. Celebrate. So, 
Yeah, so when big Sorry body. That, mate. Ah, that's why I could watch. AFL on Friday night. Oh, you're going to watch the football? Yeah, footy. Yeah. The footy. Yeah. 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 After experiencing this fanaticism for Aussie rules football, I had to find out more about this uniquely Australian game. So I went in search of a local match. Footy or Aussie rules is played on a huge oval field twice the size of an American football gridiron. Each team consists of 18 players who kick, throw, and bounce a rugby-style football. Six points are scored when the ball is kicked between two of four goalposts on each end of the field. In true Aussie fair-go style, even if you miss the main goal, there's an extra set of wider posts. If your kick makes it between these posts, you get one point just for coming close. Football brings communities together and is an important source of pride and focus for men. Due to the introduction of government schooling, law enforcement, and financial handouts, many Aboriginal men have lost their traditional roles as providers, educators, and protectors. Without these roles, many men have lost their pride and purpose. The title of this painting is Aussie Rules Football, and as you can see, the sport has given him back his direction and vitality. Football is not the only popular sport out in the bush. Rodeo is also everywhere. Next leg of my trip took me to a small town called Derby on West Australia's far north coast. Derby is a couple hours drive north of the tourist beach town of Broome. Derby has one of the highest tidal ranges in the world, over 40 feet between tides. While in Derby, I checked out the rodeo. Hit your feet! Feet, remember, feet! The popularity of rodeo is not surprising. Outback Australia is filled with many massive sheep and cattle stations, and most of the men living there are stockmen or cowboys. Yeah, it's, it's pretty big in Australia. Yeah. It's um, I don't know. It's, there's not a lot you can do. Else you can do up here, you know. <laughs> we live three hours out of town, so you can't go to town to, on weekends to play sports, so when a rodeo comes up, you got to do it. Given the abundance of other safer forms of transport, attempting to ride a massive bull seems like one of the craziest things a person can do. The basics of bull riding are easy to grasp. The rider mounts the bull in a chute and grips the rope which is pulled tightly around the sensitive belly of the bull. When the bull is released from the chute, the rider must remain on the bucking bull while keeping his other hand high in the air. A horn sounds to signal when the rider has completed his mandatory eight second ride. Aboriginal cowboys of the cattle country did much of the pioneering work for white station owners. Many became exceptional saddlemen, and today Aboriginal cowboys can be found among the elite of bull riders. And uh, how long have you been riding? Oh, for well, uh, about 11 years, I think. 11 yeah. years. Since when I was young, yeah. And what's your name again? Harold. Harold, what's your last name? I'm Bugai. I'm Bugai? I'm Bugai, with you. I'm Bugai. Yeah. Oh, wow, excellent. What, what tribe or group or community do you come from? I'm from a rural tribe right near the salt sea. Okay. Yeah. Wow, nice. Yeah. You got your family here? No, they back at home. Each ride is scored out of 100 points by two judges. Half the score is awarded to the bull. The higher and harder he bucks and kicks and turns, the more points he receives. The other half of the score is awarded to the rider, who is judged by his riding skill and finesse. Rodeo is a dangerous sport, and not just for the riders. In an attempt to dislodge its rider, this horse ran full speed toward the rodeo barricade, killing itself instantly. Rodeo is a whole weekend affair and goes well into the night. Australia's most famous animal, the kangaroo, is found all over Australia. In desert areas, they are often seen feeding on green shoots along the roadside. Unfortunately, vehicles kill many kangaroos. It's important to stop and look in the pouches of these dead kangaroos because you might find a baby joey that has survived. We have a little kangaroo found along the road here. How did you find him? Uh, mother was dead along the side of the road and I saw the two little legs 
hanging out. Oh, uh, and you rescued him. I guess you heard it. Hey there, little guy. Little girl. How are you going? From Derby, I flew down to Perth, which is the most isolated capital city in the world. From Perth, I made the eight-hour trip on the Prospector train to Kalgoorlie, a raw city exuding all the atmosphere of a frontier gold mining town. Naturally, Kalgoorlie is complete with bar brawls, brothels, and one heck of a big hole in the ground called the Super Pit. While in Kalgoorlie, I was invited by artist Denny Smith to see his little outdoor studio and to watch him work. Dinny paints on canvas in the dot painting style that evolved from aboriginal traditional sand paintings. He sold me one of his paintings that is a representational map of waterholes. Dinny is one of my favorite personalities who openly shared his unusual story with me. Careful. Careful, big man. <laughs> Wow. And your name again? Uh, Denny. Denny? Smith. Denny Smith. And yeah. how old are you? Yeah, I'm 61. 61? Yeah. Wow. Nice. Yeah, I'm 61. Yeah. I can't go Sunday all day. Oh, Denny is a, um, an Aboriginal, full-blooded Aboriginal. He's a, um, a, a, an elder. He has a wooden leg. He mm -hmm. lost it about uh, 40 years ago um, over a fight over a woman. Uh, he um, had a woman who was of the wrong skin group, not mm. skin colour, the skin group. Right. And that's uh, what determines who Aboriginals can marry mm. um, in their own, <laughs> within their own skin group. And he took up with a woman that he wasn't supposed to. In the wrong skin group. In the wrong skin group, yeah. Ah. And, uh, and then he's what listening. Happened? I know, and what happened afterwards? And um, he suffered some uh, retribution from that, a spear and he was speared in the thigh and uh, oh. the um, uh, the leg became infected yeah. and had to have her amputated. And if you ask him what happened to his leg, he won't oh. actually tell you that story. He'll actually tell you what happened to his leg, which is what happened to it after it got cut off and uh, oh. and it got thrown to the dogs. So. <laughs> Are you kidding? No. The doctors <laughs> took it off or who well, took it off? <laughs> the, the, it, would, it would have been taken off in the hospital, I suppose. But then they gave it back to him. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I don't know, but that's what he'll tell you. Oh, the dog's got it. <laughs> so, Denny, what happened to your leg? The dog's got your leg? Yeah. Hey, did the dogs get your leg after they cut it off? <laughs> <laughs> the I dogs got it? Dogs are right. Yeah, I saw a dingo up by the health center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 80% of um, Aboriginal art is a tourist-driven market, mm -hmm. um, essentially for export. Right. Um, so nearly all of that 80% would go overseas. What would be a brief description of how um, Aboriginal dot painting evolved from the sand painting that they did in the dirt into the work on canvas and this huge kind of style world, this style is known worldwide now? Yeah, it originated in a place um, called Papunya in uh -huh. the Northern Territory. Uh -huh. um, in the early 70s, mm -hmm. uh, by some of the elders, uh, there was a school teacher that went there and um, he him, yeah. um, introduced acrylic paint and canvas to the elder, uh, the Aboriginal elders, and uh -huh. they started producing these um, paints, these paintings. And it's a very um, male female thing, so there are male paintings and female paintings, mm -hmm. and there are paintings that males can only see and paintings oh. that only females can see. The important thing about art for the Aborigines is that um, they actually own the story so while they may not actually do the painting they may authorize somebody else to do the painting for oh, them right. but the story belongs to them they're a caretaker of the story they're the caretaker of the story so yeah. even though somebody else may have physically done the painting uh -huh. the painting doesn't belong to the person who's painted it, it oh, belongs yeah. to the person who has actually done the story whereas for us for yeah. Europeans um, essential part of the painting is that you do the painting, you're the artist, mm -hmm. the painting belongs to you, you've yeah. painted it. Right. That's not exactly the way it is with Aborigines. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. essentially who owns the story mm -hmm. owns the actual yeah. painting. Barely 200 years ago, Aboriginal culture existed on its own within the land of Australia. Now it is one of many cultures that share this great continent. 
It is a culture that has endured despite extreme threats and challenges to its survival. Today, appreciation and recognition grow for its unique and valuable contributions, many of which now permeate mainstream Australian life. Slowly, Aboriginal culture is reclaiming its valuable position in Australia. And what is the future for Aboriginal people? Indigenous self-management, self-determination, and more, more so, I suppose, in the um, um, Indigenous people's empowerment. Mm -hmm. and, and that is um, taking control of our own future and, and of our own destiny um, uh, without having to rely on, uh, on, uh, on other people deciding for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the modernisation and the trend of modernisation is coming like a big wave yeah. and, and all the cultural stuff is getting tucked under. Yeah. And if people see that, yeah. You can actually move it back. You can move it back. Yeah. You know, people go to the moon. Yeah. <laughs> if people have the capacity to um, provide space in which they can integrate an understanding about another culture and then mm -hmm. embrace that as part of their own identity, it essentially means that if it's a part of them, mm -hmm. then when it comes to things like understanding how to deal with land better, mm -hmm. how to deal with language, how to deal with all of the things that are different, mm -hmm there is a greater capacity because there's a sense of ownership. If we can teach young people to have a purpose in life mm -hmm. and give them a sense of belonging as well as an anchor for their future choices. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, I think, gives them a way of being able to support mm -hmm. that goal of our own national development that's uh, rooted in our own identity.